Hi, and welcome to today's Friday Transportation Seminar. I'm Nathan McNeil. I'm a research associate here at Trek, and I'll be introducing and moderating today's seminar. Our uh, Friday Transportation Seminars have been a tradition here since the year 2000. Uh, Portland State is located on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Kath Clackamas, Tumwater, well, what Lala, uh, bands of the Chinook and the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It's important to acknowledge that we're here because of the sacrifices forced on indigenous ancestors of this place. Remember these communities and honor their legacy, lives, and descendants. Today, we're pleased to have Kathy Tuttle presenting on why your city needs a car master plan. Uh, Kathy is a PhD in uh, urban design and planning who worked for several decades as a consultant city planner and as the founding executive director of Seattle Neighborhood Greenways. Before jumping into the seminar, I'd like to share some information about the upcoming uh, spring term of Friday seminars. Uh, next week, we have myself and, uh, and folks at PSU, at PBOT and TriMet presenting on prioritizing transit in Portland, uh, checking in on the Rose Lanes project. And on June 3rd, we have uh, safety interventions for houseless uh, pedestrians. So those look great, join us for those. Um, and we'd also like to share some information about a few of Trek's summer programs. The IBPI faculty workshop, which is a two day course and it supports transportation planning and engineering faculty in integrating bicycle and pedestrian topics into their courses. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in online, we'll put a link in the chat, um, but go ahead and sign up for that. Um, and uh, for those of you who are local to Oregon, you may be familiar with our annual summer camp for high school students interested in learning more about transportation concepts and careers. We've hosted over 158 students over the last six years, and it's free to attend, but seats are limited. So uh, apply by May 25th and, and share this with uh, students that you think may be interested. As an overview of today's seminar, you can expect our, speakers, our speaker to present for about 40 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. For those of you who are participating online, uh, we'll be receiving questions throughout uh, through the uh, question and answer feature on your control panel. We've also enabled closed captioning. In order to view the captions, click on the CC feature on your control panel. We'll also be recording today's seminar and it'll be available on the website later today, along with the presentation slides. And finally, if you're tracking professional development hours, this webinar is el eligible for one hour of continuing uh, education credit. With that, I will hand it over to Kathy to take it away. Great, thank, thank you, Nathan. Uh, do I have uh, my slides up now? Uh, I don't see your slides yet. Hmm. There they are. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, uh, thanks, Nathan. And I'm really honored that you and Jennifer Dill at Trek asked me to present my work to you on the downtown Portland car master plan. Uh, and thank you for spending your time listening to me. Um, thank you for doing a land acknowledgement. And I wanted to say that the first people who arrived in this area created communities and summer encampments along the rivers. And the first people in this area maintained footpaths and traveled for thousands of years by foot and by water. So I have two main goals for my talk. Uh, if I can advance my slides, I will tell you what they are, but I cannot. I need some tech support to advance this slide. Can somebody in the... Um, do you want to try uh, unsharing and share again and see if that helps? Sure. So I'll stop my sharing. I will share again. And you're not able to share. Uh, can. I will do a stop share again.
Aha. Can we see this? Looks good. Yeah. Great. Okay. So this is the table of contents of my car master plan. Um, and I have two goals for my talk. Uh, the first goal is to inspire at least some of you to create car master plans in your own communities. So right now, the car is the default design vehicle and car drivers are the default road user of all transportation plans. We plan all transportation, whether it's bike, pedestrian, freight, or transit from a car perspective. When I told Mike McGinn, who's the executive director of America Walks, and he was the former mayor of Seattle, um, that I was writing a car master plan, he laughed. And he immediately said, that's a great idea. You're turning the mirror and reframing the system. So I hope the idea of a car master plan inspires you too. My second goal for this talk is to tell you more about my ideas for the four types of drivers so that you have a better way to describe the people who drive. There isn't a monolith of drivers. There are types of people who require very different planning approaches, very different methods of persuasion. Um, also a little bit more about me. Uh, as Nathan said, I'm a city planner with decades of experience, but I also have a lot of ancestors. My PhD advisor was Anne Brene Moudon, who is best known for her book, Public Streets for Public Use. One of Anne's advisors was Jane Jacobs. So you can say my urbanist roots run really deep. And in addition to ad academic work, I worked for many years for the city of Seattle in the planning commission and in the parks department where I was the planner and project manager of 40 Seattle park developments. I started climate and transportation advocacy nonprofits and I've worked as a consultant uh, in public space planning in the US and Europe. So the car master plan, let's jump right in and talk about the 10 surprising things I learned while writing a car master plan. Um, I expect when you write a car master plan, you will come up with surprises of your own. Um, and please let me know what they are. Like I said, I've been working in urban space planning and transportation advocacy for decades, but I was surprised because I'd never looked as closely at cars as I did for this plan. For me personally, the biggest surprises were about cars themselves as physical objects. I'm a public space designer and hadn't ever really delved into the actual stuff that's used to actually build a car. Cars are made of stuff and it's really eye-opening stuff, thousands of pounds, of metals, toxic chemicals, minerals. They're mined in extremely brutal conditions and they're used to build cars. Even more toxic stuff is used to build giant car batteries. I highlight one min mineral, mica here, uh, that's mostly mined in India. There are so many stories about the stuff that makes up our millions and millions of cars that automakers do their best not to share with us. Some of these stories I think might be really used effectively by advocates. So that's a big surprise. Another big surprise was, I didn't know duh, uh, the process by which gas in your fuel tank turns into CO2. Um, how is it that when you fill up your tank with eight pounds of liquid gas, that's what uh, a gallon weighs, eight pounds, that you pump into your car, it turns into a 20 pound packet of CO2 gas in the atmosphere. So you chemists out there already know the answer. Um, it was new to me that one part of carbon burned up with two parts of oxygen creates a compound that weighs almost three times as much. So a 10 gallon tank of gas that weighs 80 pounds turns into a 200 pound mass of CO2. And it's really easy to see how a year of gas car driving puts tons of CO2 into the air. So these are facts um, that were surprises to me, but they will be universal to any car master plan that you write. What's unique to Oregon is how big a part of the economy cars are. And that's a surprise to me. 
The AAA says the average cost per year to own and maintain a car in Oregon is a little under $10,000. If that's true, my estimate is that Oregonians spend a staggering $40 billion a year to own and maintain their cars. That doesn't include the money that DOTs spend on building and maintaining roads. That car economy is the biggest reason I think we're stuck with cars. Um, another thing I did that surprised me uh, as I was putting together a car master plan was I took a, a, a slice of Portland roads and I was surprised at the sheer amount of money and materials and space that are devoted to cars in downtown Portland. So we all know that downtown cities in America have a lot of cars, but filling in the actual figures still surprised me. I did one east-west cross-section of a Portland street that stretches from the Willamette River to the 405 freeway. So this is Southwest Morrison Street. It crosses 68 lanes of moving and parking and 87% of those lanes are car lanes. 12% are transit lanes and 1% are bike lanes. Um, I also did a deep dive uh, analysis into the curb zone. This is the most valuable lanes of downtown Portland streets. Of course, I again expected that most space would be car oriented space, but the numbers still surprised me. There are uh, according to my calculations, 315,000 linear feet of curb zone space in downtown Portland. About 85% of that curb lane space is devoted to moving or storing cars, including 27,319 feet of driveways. So downtown curb lanes are 85% cars, 6% of the curb lanes are given over to transit and 4% to freight delivery. Uh, so that's 85% for cars, 6% for curbs, 4% for freight delivery, that's 95%. And the remaining 5% of the curb zone is given over in order of size to hotel zones, police cars, disability parking, motorcycle parking, bicycles, taxis, official cars, mail trucks, car share, and EV charging. So that's just 5% is all the rest of the stuff. So I wrote whole sections on cars and roads that I hope you take a closer look at. It's going to be on the web page about this, about this talk. Um, when you review the Portland Car Master Plan. It's extremely useful to have this data to point to, to be able to say not just downtown Portland sure has a lot of cars, but instead say 85% of the curb zone is devoted to moving and storing cars. And even though I think it's wonderful that 12% of downtown streets are transit lanes, 87% of downtown streets are car lanes. These are real numbers. Um, so is the money spent on road maintenance, and that includes a $4 billion backlog of street maintenance in Portland. So are the square feet of asphalt covering Portland streets, which is uh, a little over 750 million square feet of asphalt. Um, the air quality that impacts real public health outcomes, the decibel level of streets with cars. These are real numbers that can tell a story. They're impactful and they're important to collect in a car master plan. Actually, one thing I wanted to mention with this slide too, uh, that you might consider when you're writing your own car master plan is how I divided up the topics. I divided it actually into three parts. The first part, section one, is the history, how Portland grew from a frontier town to an active boat and horse wagon town to a car town. The second part is sections two, three, and four. That's the present. And then the third part, section five, uh, includes ideas for how we can look to history for ways to envision a thriving city with more controlled cars. So the second part, uh, that three section piece, uh, one is car streets, the infrastructure, the asphalt, the curbs, the parking, the potholes, the stuff that makes up the places uh, that cars move on. 
The second part in the present day is all about cars. Uh, the cars is things, how many cars there are, how they're fueled, how much they cost, the damage they do to air and water and earth and people. And then the third part um, in the present is about the drivers. Again, the present is about the roads, the, um, the, the three sections are the, the roads, the cars, and the drivers. So I divided it up into those three ways. But I want to talk to you most about the drivers. So the four types of drivers. People in Portland know Roger Geller. Uh, he's a planner who has worked for many years for the Portland Bureau of Transportation. He developed a typology in 2006 called the Four Types of Cyclists, which he called the strong and fearless cyclist, the enthused and confident, the interested but concerned, and the no way, no how cyclist. His typology has been very useful for planning bicycle infrastructure. I hope that you will consider the personas and characteristics of four types of drivers a useful model too. So how did I divide up the four types of drivers? The four types I have labeled here are the entitled, the habitual, the reluctant, and the non-driver. Let's take a look at all of them. So what we see and hear the most on streets are the entitled drivers. Entitled drivers are often on the biggest cars. They may modify them to sound very loud. They may gripe at the cost of gas, disregard the rules the community has set for the use of roads. Entitled drivers are the people who speak up loudly in favor of continued private car privilege. In short, they are the bullies that dominate our streets. Entitled drivers claim huge privilege and absolutely limit the safe, efficient use of roadways by other car users. Entitled drivers vary in age from very young people being socialized in safe street use to the very old people who lack cognitive and physical skills to manage cars, but continue to drive anyway. People do change over time, but the overarching sensibility of an entitled driver is that they bought the car, they paid for the gas, and therefore they own the road. I wrote persona stories for each driver type, and I hope those personas will get more refined if they are used for marketing and creating effective policy. So here's some of the story about entitled driver Chet. The thing Chet really likes is to drive fast. Chet's girlfriend is pretty turned on when he speeds and weaves through traffic, just like they've seen in action movies. He cranks the music up loud and just floors it. Mostly though, Chet drives alone, sitting by himself, going to work, behind the wheel, getting steamed at the stop and start traffic. Sometimes he calls his girlfriend to keep from going completely mental. When he gets off the freeway, he runs through a light just turning red and pulls up as close as he can to the front door of the local quick mart, narrowly beating another car headed to the same spot. He feels like he won that spot. Entitled drivers are aggressive. Habitual drivers are really habituated drivers who tend to feel a bit trapped because they need to drive every day. Why do habitual drivers always drive? Habitual drivers drive because they've always driven and because it's the easy choice. Cars are more reliable and less expensive than transit for them. Biking seems overwhelming and roads are designed for cars and parking is convenient wherever they go. The system is designed for habitual drivers and driving is a habit that's hard to break. 
Jessica is a habitual driver. She gets up early in the morning, eats a bowl of cereal, takes her car keys from the front table and drives. Jessica drives all day, every day. Jessica drives to work, to school, to the grocery store, to visit friends, to see her parents, to go to the gym and to go to church. As is true for all habitual drivers, her car is woven into her life like the milk she pours over her breakfast cereal. Pre-pandemic, Jessica used to drive to work three miles away. She has a new job that's a little further away and she's looking into taking the Max to work, provided she can park for free close to the Max station. Jessica is the reason Max stations and schools, parks, grocery stores, coffee shops, gyms, and churches are surrounded by acres of free parking and why residential streets are lined with cars. Jessica always looks for and expects free parking. Driving is a family habit. Jessica grew up with her parents driving her everywhere to school, ballet lessons, friends' houses. Jessica's parents always drove. Jessica got her license when she turned 16 and felt so independent when she could drive to the same places her parents had been driving her. Jessica has never been involved in a collision and she goes just a few miles over the speed limits, keeping up with the flow of other habitual driver traffic. Jessica's uncle, her mother's brother, died in a car crash when Jessica was 20, but that didn't deter Jessica from driving at all. She drove to her uncle's funeral, as did her parents and her brother, all in their own cars. Jessica occasionally wonders if her father should stop driving now that he is over 70 and has trouble with his eyesight. But she knows her dad would be pretty helpless without a car and he seems to cope okay. She thinks her dad will likely drive until the day he dies. Habitual drivers are a good 30% of the population. And it's likely the best driver type to target for behavior change. Habits are strong, but they're also malleable. People can change habits a lot easier then they can change their sense of entitlement. Reluctant drivers are pretty rare, maybe 5% of the population. They take many of their trips by other modes, but still need a car for their trips to the suburbs to see elderly parents, or for a work commute that makes no sense by transit, or for a car trip to go hiking on the weekends. Um, here are some stories about reluctant drivers. Emory is a reluctant driver. They used to commute to work on a bus, but since transit service was cut, the bus takes 95 minutes, while driving to work takes only 10 minutes. They bought a car. They can't afford to move closer to their job. And besides, who knows how long they'll stay at this job. Maria and Don are also reluctant drivers. They have a cleaning business and need to haul their supplies from one job site to another, often very late at night when transit isn't running at all. Maria and Don are reluctant drivers because their car costs are a huge part of their monthly expenses. They came from a city where buses ran all day and night and they liked going to their jobs by bus. It was so much less exhausting. Ashley mostly goes to work, to shop, and picks up her young kids by cargo bike. She becomes a reluctant driver when she uses the family car to go hiking in the summer and to visit her parents at the holidays. Ashley worries that as her kids start playing sports more, her weekend and after school driving will become habitual. And then 
there are the non-drivers. And this was one of my top 10 most surprising findings too, that non-drivers are 40% of the population. That is huge. Non-drivers sometimes ride in cars, but they do not drive cars. And their lives would be immeasurably improved if 40% of transportation staff and transportation funding was going to streets for non-drivers. So who are these 40% of Portlanders who do not drive? A third of them are children, a third are other abled people, and a third are too poor to drive. There's a tiny fraction of folks who are what I call privileged non-drivers of choice. But basically Portland is a third each in each category of children, other abled people, and very poor people. Here are a few quick stories about non-drivers. Ellie walks to school. Kenzo wants to play outside. Charlie has traumatic brain injury. Anna has low vision. Edna has barely enough money to buy groceries. Hami is a non-driver because he's a climate activist. So when I was presenting this model to some transportation staff, I did get pushback for including children in the pool of non-drivers. My answer to them was, well, kids are people, people with as much right to the street as anyone else. And then that got me thinking about the fact that most, all of the 40% of people who are non-drivers are people that groups like business chambers and homeowner associations have decided don't have a right to streets because they don't contribute as much to the economic vitality of the city. The very poor, the other abled and children. So what we are saying as a society is that these three groups, these 40% really don't have a right to the roads as much as entitled drivers or habitual drivers, the very poor, the other abled and children. It's a question of fairness. And I'd push back and say that in fact, cities that are now bankrupting themselves to maintain the car economy and streets for cars would be better off getting out of the maintenance business and into building great 20 minute neighborhoods for people of all ages, all abilities and all income levels. There's a lot going on with non-drivers that I think must be refined, but I wanna get back to the whole four types of driver model and how it's a useful construct for planning and controlling car use in cities. So how can cities control entitled drivers? Entitled drivers are road bullies. Researching entitled drivers, I actually watched a lot of these videos about rolling coal and drag racing. And I learned a lot about laws and licensing and how our streets are devolving year by year with a complete lack of camera or other fair and meaningful enforcement. There are also micro and not so micro aggressions of entitled drivers that make road use unfair and inequitable. And more expensive for DOTs to do repair, street hardening and control. Entitled drivers need first and foremost to have clear guidelines about how they can fairly use our streets. It's up to agencies and elected leaders to start creating those guidelines that specifically target entitled drivers. Habitual drivers, well, how do you target them? It's in their name. Habitual drivers are people who form habits and do what is easiest. They can be more easily swayed if their choices are easy, cheap, and reliable. 
They want to be part of a group. They want to act collectively to do their part. Messaging and policies for habitual drivers will be dramatically different than what entitled drivers need, which is rules and physical constraints. And reluctant drivers, we haven't talked so much about them, but reluctant drivers are the bridge. Reluctant drivers are the aware drivers. Some habitual drivers will become reluctant drivers and all reluctant drivers will be able to advise about what is making it necessary for them to use a car and how systems can change so they can get around more easily without driving. And as to the non-drivers, it's worthwhile to continue a community discussion and decide if we are in fact calling streets public space. And if we want that space only available with the people, for, for people with the money to buy and maintain a car. I'd love to see more privileged non-drivers of choice, but in America, it takes a lot of effort, training, money, and luck to be a non-driver of choice. Personally, I think that cities that are dedicated to providing street space fairly to children, to other abled people, and to the very poor people are some of the most delightful cities in the world. So, I've already touched on some of my final recommendations, help habitual drivers change their habits, get laws into place that actually control entitled car bullies, build streets for kids, fund changes by charging fair prices for road use and parking cars. I leave you with a final recommendation, which is that it's time. We need to build streets for the future we want, not for the present we have. I hope you think about the four types of drivers and not just drivers as a single entity when you develop your policies and plans. I hope I've inspired some of you to push the envelope further and that you will write car master plans for your own communities. There's a lot more in the plan. I Hope you take a look at it. And thanks again for listening. I hope there are some questions. Well, thank you, Kathy. That was really fascinating. And we are starting to get some questions uh, coming in. And uh, I have a few myself and I, I maybe I, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with one of mine and then uh, move in uh, to some that are showing up in the Q&A box. Um, but I'm fascinated as I, as I listen to you and, and, and see the content of what you have in here, that it strikes me almost as an anthropology of cars or kind of trying to elucidate this culture. And I, I guess I wonder if you were somebody that came from a culture that or a society that didn't have cars and were dropped into the middle of a, an American city, you know, what would you think? And would, would this be a plan that could kind of help them understand what, what was in front of them? I mean, I, I do think anthropological skills are great for, for approaching city planning. I do have a master's degree in anthropology. Um, and so that is, does define how I do a lot of my research. But I also think it's very, very important that we do tease apart how we got to the, to the car culture that we have now. We can't make changes to it until we really do understand, you know, the history of it and then also what underlies each of the, the car elements. I mean, the fact that, you know, I mean, how often have you thought about what a car is made of, you know? I mean, did you know that, you know, kids in India are dying of silicosis mining mica to paint our cars with? No, you know, but, these are important things to pay attention to. Um, the questions are starting to flow in now, so I will get to some of the people that are really interested in this. Um, so one I see here that I was interested in as well is how did you figure out how many drivers belong to each of the four categories? Um, and what advice would you have to those who wanna perform a similar analysis or breakdown? Well, you know, I sort of used Roger Geller's model of, you know, like just, 
<laughs> wing it. Uh, I mean, I think the easiest one actually to, to determine was the, um, the non-drivers. I mean, it is, you know, there are a third of the Portland population is children, 26% is other able, but I figured about half of that would be people that were unable to drive. And then another 13% is in the, or, or non-drivers, you know, that that's, those are statistically valid numbers. Um, but the, you know, who's habitual, who's entitled. I mean, I had arguments with many people about, you know, more people are actually habitual and, you know, fewer are entitled, but, you know, it's it's a range, it's a it's a continuum. And, but I, I think it's a useful model for, again, for planning about how to do the out, uh, outreach and the fact that entitled drivers have disproportionately loud voices in community forums, I think is something that we need to pay attention to. And also they're going to, they also have a disproportionate impact on uh, road maintenance and on uh, traffic violence. And so having tools that deal with entitled drivers is very important. Uh, thanks. Um, and I see a couple in here um, about, well, maybe I'll start with one, which is, um, the question is how has this been received by a pol political leadership? But I guess, yeah, kind of, how do you take this sort of a plan and have it be, have it influence politicians, decision makers uh, and, and affect policy? I mean, I think the most important thing is to have, you know, very solid data uh, because, you know, the, you know, knowing the, the carbon impacts and the, the, the air pollution quality and the, you know, the, the percentage of streets that are devoted to car and movement, you know, that it's 85%. I mean, those, and that there's 750, you know, 750 million square feet of asphalt. I mean, those are numbers that, that you know, certain policymakers react to very strongly. Uh, I think you can't just sort of say there are a lot of cars and, you know, let's deal with it. I mean, I think saying there are, you know, 750,000 square feet of asphalt and we want to get it down to 500,000 square feet of asphalt might have more impact, you know, to give people real metrics to shoot for because we are in this climate and, you know, car emergency. And I think that, you know, we need numbers to be able to, to, to unwheel ourselves from the place where we are now. Okay. Um, and I see a couple of questions in here that are just interested in a little bit more detail on, um, on how and why you put this together. Uh, you know, one is asking, was it funded and, and what type of implementation has it seen? So maybe if just um, you know, to back up and uh, explain kind of why you came to this and uh, if, if there's been any movement on, a, you know, an implementation or any sort of, uh, you know, what what you expect the impacts of this particular plan to be? So if if people know funding sources for this kind of research, Nathan, you have any ideas? Uh, no, it, I'm on sabbatical, and I had actually had intended to uh, to to look actually more at the the PCEF, the Portland Clean Energy Fund, and you know how that was being implemented. But PCEF is is taking an odd kind of turn right now, so I started looking at. A topic that I knew a lot about, and I just got kind of drawn into it. I think it's it is worthwhile to to continue it and to to do more work on it. And I do hope that some students or or researchers find a way to incorporate some some of that mirror of looking at at car master plans rather than modal plans for each of the other kinds of of elements around cars. You know, instead of looking at a freight plan, look at car plans and then. How freight is integrated into the into the car plan. I think we're we just always assume that we're like swimming in car, rather than than you know that the car is just one of many modes. Um, so have is there have you? There's a question about. Um, you know, your, what feedback you've gotten from city personnel or other pushback besides um, children. And I, and I, on the, you know, the question of if they should be included, but I guess more broadly, um, 
you know, is there any potential? Are you are you are you getting a sense that there is an interest in uptake for this sort of a plan, either either here in Portland or elsewhere, places where um, you think this sort of thing could could take hold? Well, I think you know, since people are so interested both in climate and reducing car uh, ridership, you know, I mean, we have these really ambitious goals in in most cities now of of you know traveling by modes other than than car and we have you know the the laudable goal of equitable transportation uh, i think that yes i think that when people say actually you know we aren't planning for that 40 percent of users i think that that as as an equity issue has a has a high potential of being taken up by by planners i i think that you know again it was a surprise i didn't really understand that number until I started working on this plan, that it was 40% of people cannot use our roads effectively. Uh, and I think that's very powerful if we're really trying to build an equitable city. It's something that European cities are, you know, the ones that we all love to talk about and go to really are doing. They're saying we care about our poor people and our children and our other abled people and our streets are set up so that they can more effectively use those places. Um, yeah, I was also fascinated by that number and I was surprised and I don't know why I should be, but it kind of, it, it, you're holding up that lens to say, um, you know, these are the things we take for granted and maybe we should <laughs> think twice about them. Um, let's see. So there are a lot of questions in here. Let me see. Um, let's see. Uh, well, there are, so there are a few about, you know, have, are, have, do you know if car master plans that have been implemented or by another name anywhere? Um, I mean, arguably transportation plans are kind of default car plans, but they don't look like kind of think about the car as vehicle at all. I've never seen a a plan that sort of describes, I mean, I've seen freight plans. There are very few freight plans, by the way. You you know this, you know, there, I was surprised there are so few freight plans, but, you know, nobody says this is the the thing, the, the, the design element that's moving through our streets. You know, I haven't seen that. Uh, I've been looking for them. I've been asking about it. Uh, Hopefully it's I mean, soon. <laughs> the start of a movement, maybe. But I think, um, I think it's a valid way to, to look at, at, at cities and streets. Yeah. Um, okay. So I see a question on um, the um, habitual and the reluctant. And uh, they say people in Copenhagen bike because it's convenient and Manhattan, Manhattanites take the subway because it's convenient. The habituated cohort makes a lot of sense, um, but 5% seems low for reluctant. Um, did you consider combining the two for simplicity or maybe, um, you know, and you might, I, I'd be curious to hear about kind of what yeah. really does separate the two? I, I, I think it is that awareness factor. Uh, the reluctant driver is somebody that is aware that they are driving and they, are reluctant to do so. I mean that they're they're looking for they're they're a frequent other mode user and that they are aware of their impact as they drive. Um, you know, there's the extreme of non-driver, the privileged non-driver of choice who says, I'm giving up driving completely, but you know, I still have a driver's license. I rent a car when I go on vacation. You know, I mean, there I, you know, would I, I say I'm a reluctant driver? Well, and when I'm driving on vacation, I am. Um, so yeah, I think that there is a, a, a space for those reluctant drivers and they are, like I also said, a bridge that, you know, that the habitual drivers can, you know, travel over to get to become reluctant drivers. I mean, that's where we ideally want a lot of the habitual folks to end up is to become aware drivers and to limit their, you know, one mile trips to the grocery store to pick up milk. You know, that, that is where we're trying to, and, and so instead of being the daily habituated driver, they're more thoughtful about their car use. Um, and there's a question about in here uh, about that kind of potential transition between these, these groups or cohorts. 
Um, but they're, they're curious about it going the other way. So they said, I found that the folks that you label as habitual drivers become entitled when a driver is when there's ever a suggestion that the speed limit or parking be reduced. Um, so is that something that you've explored uh, or maybe the, the, the factors that could move people one way or the other? You know, I haven't looked into that. And I think that's a really interesting topic to, to think about and to, to do some research on. I mean, what is it that turns somebody from a just a daily middle of the road, matter of fact driver into somebody that is, is, is hyper aggressive um, and protective? And parking is probably the, the number one thing. Um, but I, I also think, you know, habitual drivers tend to like sort of act as a group and do want to do the right thing and do want to, you know, respect the rules of the road as much as other habitual drivers are doing. You know, they, they speed, but only five miles above the speed limit, not, not drag race. Oh. Um, and there are a couple of questions about the, how, how it's hard to, uh, can, to, to get the habitual drivers to, to reassess or to rethink. Um, and so one is, uh, it seems to me that the data evidence doesn't always get people over the line to leave their cars. So how do we reach the hearts of habitual drivers? And just to, to look at the other one is similar. Are there strategies that encourage habitual drivers to try new habits? Um, and they suggest in cities with good transit, maybe high gas prices would be would help be a motivator. But I guess, yeah, like what do you? I mean, money, money certainly is going to be something that helps people make that choice, you know, to, you know, whether it's it's congestion fees or, you know, that they find that it's just a lot easier to take that one mile trip by a walk rather than a than a, a car drive. I mean, the, that that is a, a monetary thing. You pay for parking, you pay for a road toll when you come downtown. You, I mean, there's lots of different ways of of controlling habitual choices, but then you you do, you absolutely do need to give people good good alternatives. Um, and a lot of them are, are things that they are, um, th that they need training in. I think that's something we don't do a lot of that I lived it for a year in Sweden and they do a lot of training of people of how, you know, and ch children are trained how to use bikes, bikes for, for everyday transportation and, um, Adults are trained from a young age by their parents, but also deliberately in schools about how to use bus systems. You know, we just sort of expect people to be able to figure out, you know, any kind of transportation choices without without really training them. So I think habitual people are, are open to training and are, you know, would welcome it in a lot of circumstances. Yeah. Um... Another, so you, you are getting a lot of uh, a lot of comments and feedback here. So we still got some to go through, and if you're okay, we'll uh, we got a few minutes left to. to Anything continue. nasty? I want to hear the I want to hear the angry ones. Well, I, so here's a very interesting one, which is not not an angry one, but um, they say what I like about the car master plan is that many or or some cities have targets for cars, and that Portland is thirty percent of all trips. But we have no plan that focuses on the car side as a way to achieve that goal. The focus instead is on boosting numbers for non-car modes. It seems like a car master plan could focus on the necessary tools to reduce cars to our target goals. Um, was that a direct consideration in developing your plan? Oh, that's that's a brilliant comment. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I read a lot of the, you know, the transportation plans that are floating around the climate plans, the transportation plans, the from the state level and the city level. And yeah, it's all about how exactly that, how to boost boost those numbers rather than than reduce the car numbers and the strategies for doing that. So is reducing cars, is, redu is reducing driving like a third rail of uh, transportation politics or how do you? Uh, uh, parking is the third rail. Um, I think the, uh, you know, we have to get over that. Um, the, but I think getting people to make trips by, especially easy trips, you know, a walk to school, a walk to a local cafe, uh, uh, trip chaining, those kinds of things, people can learn and, you know, the habitual driver in particular 
will be happy to kind of do their part. The entitled driver, not so much. Um, well, let's see. There's a question about um, if you have knowledge of, that, or maybe from the people that you've talked to, how has this plan and this approach been received by uh, by planners and traffic engineers? And, and you know, what sort of feedback do you get from people that are thinking about this professionally? They're they're intrigued. Um, you know, it's because it is a new approach to 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 look at the other side, to look at the car side. Um, but you know, we're we're still in a a place right now in Portland and most American cities where questioning the validity of, you know, owning and um, using a car badly are, 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 are still difficult conversations to have with politicians because they know the entitled driver is the person that is going to, you know, loudly complain and vote against them and still you know, do dangerous things on the street and have no consequence for them. I mean, have you read about the 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 spinning games and the the sliding games in Portland? Unbelievable! I've been like looking at old news stories. You know, the the things that people had to go through to get control over sliding through intersections that disrupted, you know, workplaces and you know, Columbia warehouse factories where they couldn't distribute clothing because people were sliding in front of their their factory every weekend and there were there's no consequence for these things you know i mean that's the things that politicians really need to to get out on a limb and, and get in front of and stop you know and there's a and you know i mean one of the things i have and i didn't talk about it is that i think a lot of these are state laws and you know, I think it's a more difficult lift even in the state than it is in the city to make changes. But I think they have to be done, you know, because it's it's such a disproportionate impact on our on our streets, both the kind of the infrastructure of the streets themselves and then the ability of anybody else to use streets. Um, a comment just came in that says, entitled drivers may be more malleable than the presentation suggests. I recently completed a three hour driver uh, awareness class and it was very effective in demonstrating how our mindset when driving can affect our safety and the safety of those around us. Um, so maybe maybe we need some research into how do how do you uh, change the entitled driver mindset. I think that that is a great topic for some <laughs> to talk more after this. Um, let's see. I want to know how many people out, out there are actually thinking about writing a car master plan now or contributing to it at least. I don't know if anybody wants to chime in in the comments or yeah. uh, you know, if, if you feel motivated to, to do that. Um, I, 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 I think it's, uh, I can see it happening. Um, there is a question here. What about uh, commercial drivers? How would they? Did you think about how they fit into your your four types at all? Um, a little bit. I mean, one of the things that actually surprised me is how little downtown road space is given over to freight and freight loading and freight lanes. And I mean, I think freight and and commercial driving should be the most supported kind of driving that's happening downtown that and, and transit, and but there's very little space dedicated to it. So I assume there's very little money dedicated to it. I appreciate the fact that Portland is one of the few, I think one of the four cities in America that has a freight master plan and that it's a pretty good one. Uh, and the freight drivers themselves, as a, as a rule, I think they tend to be people that, because they rely on driving for their, their employment, tend to be more um, professional about driving um that's, there's one or two questions i want to hit on and then maybe we'll wrap it up um the first one in here that i 
was curious for your thoughts on or what city or cities would you point to as a model for for how Portland should evolve or that have you know that are maybe doing this a little bit better and either yeah so, so I'll leave it at that I mean you know obviously we're all enamored of northern, northern European cities and you know a few cities in Spain and uh, you know that are are really starting to pay. I, and I, I, I do think it's really important to, to actually have the needs of children, other able people and poor people in your mind as you're doing transportation planning. I mean, I think that that is the thing that makes a difference in those cities. Um, and, you know, can we point to American cities that are putting children and other able people first? I, I haven't seen them yet. Um, there are more questions in here, and I and I know that you'll uh, I will answer get, them. get to the list. Uh, so we will share those with Kathy and and um, and have I think some answers available for folks after afterwards. Um, maybe to close it off, I, there is a question about uh, what metrics uh, that would be helpful for developing a do you think would be helpful for developing a car master plan, but you couldn't find? So are there pieces of information that would have would have helped um, kind of understand this a little bit better? You know, parking was actually a very, and curb lane use was a very hard thing to find. I mean, it, it looks like I have like lots of information on it, but I, I really had to dig and also, you know, do my own tabulations. Uh, I mean, the, the city provides some of it, but they didn't put it in a way that was actually usable. Um, and so, yes, uh, and I still don't really know, and I've talked to people from the parking reform network, how many actual parking spaces there are in garages. There's estimates of it, but not actual spaces. And I think those should be paying for a lot of the road improvements. But I, I think the thing that I, I like the most is, um, if I wanted actual data, is information about um, air pollution, you know, on a kind of a more narrow frame and also on decibel levels. I think having that information about places that are more livable because they're quieter and because they're less polluted uh, would be an interesting piece of information to look at corridors, carbon corridors and noise corridors in the city. Okay. Um... Let's see, so I'm gonna pop up one slide here and wrap it up. Um, so uh, again, thank you, Kathy Tuttle, for this really fascinating uh, presentation about the Car Master Plan. Thank you. Um, Nick. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this concludes the fall series. No, not the fall series. Uh, for those of you joining online after the seminar ends, you'll have an opportunity to complete a brief survey about today's event. It only takes a few minutes, and we would appreciate your feedback. Um, so thanks so much again, Kathy, for, for joining us, and everyone have a, a great weekend.